So today we are going to start with Taylor's theorem. Before going to the exact statement of the theorem, let us try to motivate you. Suppose I have given a polynomial, I will write it as fx. Since it is a polynomial, I can write it as a0 plus a1x plus a2x square and so on up to a n x to the power n. So, this is a degree n polynomial. I also assume that all the coefficients of this polynomial that is a i's they are all real numbers. So, a i belongs to R for 0 less or equals to i less or equals to n. Now, since we know that any polynomial is differentiable as many times as you want, the function f is differentiable as many times as I want and I can see clearly that if I look at derivatives of the function of power bigger than n, then the derivatives will certainly be 0. But now, let us notice something. What is f of 0? I can see very clearly that f of 0 is a 0. Then what is f prime at 0? So, for that I need to calculate what is f prime of x and I get that this is a 1 plus twice a 2 x plus that is terms containing higher powers of x. This then implies that f prime at 0 is equals to a 1. Similarly, I can see that f double prime x which certainly exist, this is twice a 2 plus terms containing x. This would then imply that f double prime of 0 is twice a 2, which then implies that a 2 is f double prime 0 divided by 2. <coughs> if I go on likewise, I can actually produce the following formula, we can prove that a n or I would say a k that is f k 0 divided by factorial k for all k satisfying 0 less or equals to k less or equals to n. Here the convention is that the 0th derivative means just the function, that means I am not differentiating. So, in the light of this, I can actually write down f x as this. This is equals to f 0 plus x f prime 0 plus x square by factorial 2 f double prime 0 plus x to the power k divided by factorial k times f k 0 and then we go towards the last term. Since it is a degree n polynomial, I have to stop after the nth derivative because after that all the derivatives are 0. I get x to the power n by factorial n times f n 0. Now, here, what exactly I am using about the polynomials? It seems from this expression, all I am using is that the function is differentiable as many times as I want. So, given a function, let us say f is a function on a closed interval a v to r. Assume that f is n times differentiable.
and then I want to see whether f can be written as an expression like the above which I have written here. So, I am looking for a generalization of this for arbitrary function f which has as many derivatives as I want. Now, in terms of b and a, it should then look like that f of b equals to f of a plus b minus a into f prime a plus b minus a whole square divided by factorial 2 f double prime a plus I get the last term that is b minus a whole to the power n by factorial n f n a. Question is, is this true? Notice that this is related to the previous equation. Just put b equals to x and a equals to 0 and get the previous expression. Now, we are asking for that given a, if I take any b, then is it true that f b is given as the previous expression. Now, if you look at this expression which I have written here, if you fix a, for a fixed, if I call this above expression as star, then star is a polynomial in B, right? That is obvious. That if I fix my A as the base point and keep on varying B and I look at the right hand side star, that means it is a polynomial in B. But given a function which is differentiable as many times as I want, why it should be a polynomial? For example, you know examples of some such functions, e to the power x, sin x, cosin x, these are not polynomial functions. That means, this star cannot be true in general. For polynomials, it might be true, but for general functions, it is not expected that it will be true. So, what exactly is true is given by Taylor's theorem. So, now we go to the precise statement of Taylor's theorem. You will see it is very close to the expression which I have written in the box in the red, that is this one. Okay? So, let us go to the precise statement of Taylor's theorem. Let f be a function defined on the closed interval a b to r. Suppose, f prime, f double prime and so on up to f n minus 1, which means the n minus 1 is derivative of f are continuous in the closed interval a b and f n exists in the open interval a b. Then Taylor's theorem says, then there exists C such that A less C less B such that F of B equals to F of A plus b minus a into f prime a plus b minus a whole square divided by factorial 2 f double prime a plus so on up to b minus a to the power n minus 1 by n minus 1 factorial 
times f n minus 1 into a plus the last term which is b minus a to the power n minus 1 by n minus 1 factorial. But now f n at c. So, everywhere it is the derivatives of a f at a appearing, but the last term where you get c and this c now depends on b. If this c is independent of b, then you can see that f will actually be a polynomial, but that may not be the case. That is why the c which I have written in the last term, it depends on the point b. It is exactly like the phenomena in the mean value theorem. The same thing happens in the mean value theorem also. The point c you get which lies between a and b, that point depends on the endpoints. Here also the point c actually depends on the endpoints. That means that f not actually a polynomial, okay? it has just this expression. Now let us try to prove this. Well, the proof goes like this. First, I am going to define a function capital F, but the function f will depend on n. So, I define capital F at n minus 1 at x. The idea is you keep b put x instead of a in the above expression. That is capital F of n minus n into x is f of b minus f of x minus b minus x into f prime at x minus b minus x whole square divided by factorial 2 f double prime x and so on up to b minus x to the power n minus 1 by n minus 1 factorial into f n minus 1 into x. That means, what is our aim? I essentially have to prove that there exist c such that a less c less b and if n minus 1 into a equals to b minus a to the power n by factorial n times f n c. This is what I need to prove. <coughs> Now, what I do is I vary the parameter n. So, for k lesser equals to n minus 1, what I do is I define a function f k analogously as the previous one. I define f k at x equals to f b minus f x minus b minus x into f prime x and so on up to my last term is b minus x to the power k by factorial k into f k x. Okay? Among this class of functions f n minus 1, I have already told you what it is. Now, first thing I claim is, so this is my claim. The claim is that f k prime at x is equals to minus b minus x to the power k by factorial k times f k plus 1 x. To prove this, we can actually proceed inductively. So, let us first take k to be equals to 1. So, what is then f 1 x? f 1 x is just f b minus f x So, f 1 x is just f b minus f x 
minus b minus x into f prime x and then f1 prime at x turns out to be minus f prime x minus b times f double prime x plus f prime x plus x f double prime x. If I cancel terms, what I get is minus b minus x times f double prime x. This precisely matches with the formula with the claim which I have written for k to be equals to 1. Now, what I am going to do is I will just assume this result and try to prove it for f k plus 1. Okay? So, assume that the claim is true for k Let us see the formula for f k x, it is b minus x to the power same power k, then factorial k, then derivative has 1 power extra, that is k plus 1. So, when we write down f k plus 1 x, it should go to up to k plus 2. From the given formulas, it is very clear that f k plus 1 x is actually f k x minus b minus x to the power k plus 1 divided by k plus 1 factorial into f k plus 1 x. Now, I look at the derivative of this. I look at f k plus 1 prime x. What I get is f k prime x now the derivative of the next term which I can calculate surely which is plus b minus x to the power k by factorial k into f k plus 1 x minus b minus x to the power k plus 1 divided by k plus 1 factorial into f k plus 2 x. Now, I plug in the formula for f k prime x, which I have assumed. So, this then is minus b minus x to the power k by factorial k into f k plus 1 x. That is my assumption. Then I just write down the other terms, which is b minus x power k by factorial k into f k plus 1 x, then minus the other term that is b minus x to the power k plus 1 by k plus 1 factorial into f k plus 2 x. Now, I can cancel the first terms, first two terms that is this one and this one. So, the answer is the third term, but that is precisely same with my claim. So, we have proved the claim for all k's. So, in particular, this implies the result is true for f n minus 1 also. So, f n minus 1 prime x now turns out to be minus b minus x whole to the power n by factorial n, then f n x. Okay. Now, I am going to use this in the following form. What I do is, I define a function, define a function g on closed interval a b by g x equals to f n minus 1 x minus b minus x to the power n divided by b minus a to the power n into f n minus 1 into a. <coughs> now, clearly 
g is a differentiable function and then we check certain things here that what is g of b that is f n minus 1 b because the other term is 0 b minus b which is 0. So, I just get f n minus 1 b, but now let us look at the formula for f n minus 1 b. f n minus 1 b the written formula if I put x to be equals to b I can certainly see from this formula that f n minus 1 b is 0. So, this is equals to 0. What is g of a that is f n minus 1 a minus b minus a power n divided by b minus a power n into f n minus 1 a which is same as 0. So, g is a differentiable function which vanishes at the endpoints. So, this implies by Rolle's theorem there exist C in the open interval A B such that G prime of C is equals to 0. Now, G prime of C equals to 0 implies f n minus 1 prime at c minus the derivative of the other function at c. <coughs> that means, n times b minus c to the power n minus 1 the sign would be plus divided by b minus a power n f n minus 1 into a that is equals to 0. But remember, I have an expression for the function capital F n minus 1 prime, which I am going to use now. This would then imply that minus b minus c whole to the power n by n minus 1 factorial into F n c this follows from my claim which I have proved then plus the term which I have calculated b minus c to the power n minus 1 divided by b minus a whole to the power n times f n minus 1 a which is equals to 0. This would then imply that f n minus 1 a Remember the way I have defined the function capital F n minus 1, my job was to show that capital F n minus 1 at A is actually the last term in the Taylor series, that is the term involving C, which we will see how it comes out. This is then equals to B minus A power n divided by n into B minus C power n minus 1 into b minus c power n divided by n minus 1 factorial into f n c. If I calculate this, what comes out is b minus a power n divided by factorial n into f n c, which is precisely I wanted to prove. Now, I just write down the definition of f n minus 1 at A, which is equals to the last term of the Taylor series. That proves Taylor's theorem. Now, we address another issue. It is the convergence problem. Suppose, I have a function f such that all the derivatives of f exist of all possible order that is f prime, f double prime, so on, f n and it goes on. So, for example, I can take f x to be equal to e to the power x, it is a function whose derivatives of all order exist. 
I could have also taken f x equals to sin x for which also derivatives of all order exist. So, I look at some such function and then I can certainly write down this f 0 plus x f prime 0 plus x square y factorial to f double prime 0 and I go on writing it. Notice that I can go on writing it because derivatives of all possible order exist and hence the series makes sense. So, I actually have an infinite series at my hand. I look at this summation n from 0 to infinity f n 0 by factorial n times x to the power n with the convention of course, with the convention that f 0 is f. So, I get an infinite series or if you recall I actually get a power series this is called the Taylor series of f. But the question now is whether this series makes sense. Does this series converge because it is an infinite series and if it does, does it converge to the function f? Well, it turns out that in many cases it does converge to the function, but there are examples of functions for which the Taylor series even if it converges it may not converge to the function. So, we will see all these examples, but before that let us first try to understand how exactly we determine whether the Taylor series converges to the function or not. So, for that I am going to use Taylor's theorem. What I have proved is that given x there exists c which lies between 0 and x such that f x is equals to f of 0 plus x f prime 0 plus x to the power n minus 1 by n minus 1 factorial f n minus 1 0 plus x to the power n by factorial n times f n c. Now, writing in different fashion I will say that this implies that x to the power n by factorial n into f n c is equals to f x minus summation k equals to 0 to n minus 1 x to the power k by factorial k into f k 0. Notice that <coughs> the term written in the sum is precisely the nth partial sum of the Taylor series. And if I want to know if whether the Taylor series converges to the function or not, all I have to check is that the modulus of f x minus the partial sums go to 0 as n increases, which is same as saying that the left hand side should go to 0 as n goes to infinity. So, we call that the remainder term. So, I define R n f x to be equals to x to the power n by factorial n times f n c. Notice here that c do depend on x. So, for the convergence of the Taylor series what we have to look at is mod r n f x which is same as modulus of f x minus summation k from 0 to n minus 1 x to the power k y factorial k times f k 0 should go to 0 as n goes to infinity. This is required for convergence of the Taylor series
to the function. Well, there are certain easy cases where this happens. <coughs> so, I will just write it here. Assume that f n that is the nth derivative of f is bounded by a number m for all n that is I am saying that modulus of f n x is lesser equals to m for all n and x if this happens. Well, as example, let us first see the function f x equals to e to the power x. But first, we have to be sure that if this boundedness of the derivative is there, then I will get the convergence. Why do this happens? Because then modulus of r n f x I look at, what is its definition? I know it is modulus of x to the power n by factorial n times f n c. Since f n c is bounded by m, this would mean that this is lesser equals to m times x to the power n by factorial n. Now, I will just guarantee that x to the power n by factorial n converges to 0 as n goes to infinity. Well, for that what do we do is I define y n equals to x to the power n by factorial n. And then I note that y n plus 1 divided by y n, it turns out to be x to the power n plus 1 by n plus 1 factorial into factorial n divided by x to the power n, which is x by n plus 1 but my x is fixed, so it converges to 0. And then by a previous exercise which we have dealt with while doing, dealing with sequences, that this implies the actual sequence y n converges to 0. That means r n f x converges to 0, that means the nth partial sum converges to f x for a given x. Now I am going to use this for the function f x equals to e to the power x. Let us see what happens. I have then f prime at x is e to the power x. Not only that, for any arbitrary n, f n x is e to the power x. This then implies that f n 0 is equals to 1. Then what is my r n f x? This is then x to the power n by factorial n into f n c that is x to the power n by factorial n into e to the power c. And this is certainly equals to f x which is e to the power x minus summation k from 0 to n minus 1 x to the power k by factorial k into f k at 0, which I have noticed is actually equals to 1. Now, I have given a fixed x. If x lies between minus m and m, let us say, then e to the power c is bounded by e to the power m for all x in minus m m. This then implies that mod r n f x is lesser equals to mod x to the power n divided by factorial n into e to the power m.
So, I get that R n f x is less or equals to mod x power n divided by factorial n into e to the power m. Now, in e to the power m there is no n dependence, n dependence is only on mod x and factorial n. But I have already established that the first factor this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity and e to the power m is a constant. So, this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. This then implies the familiar formula that e to the power x is actually 1 plus x plus x square by factorial 2 plus plus x to the power n by factorial n and so on. This series converges to e to the power x for all x and the right hand side is precisely the Taylor series of the function. Now, let us look at example of another familiar function. I take f x to be equals to sin x. This is a good example to deal with, you will see, because whatever derivative of f x I look at, it is either sin or cosine. In any case, they are all bounded functions. So, the convergence of the Taylor series won't be much of a problem. And since I want to write down the Taylor series of the function around 0, it will turn out that the derivatives, precise value of the derivative I can calculate because it is either sin or cosine. Well, a calculation yields that f n at 0 is equals to minus 1 to the power k if n is of the form 2 k plus 1 and it is equals to 0 if n is equals to 2 k. That means, the even powers of x which should appear in the Taylor series will disappear because the derivative at 0 will be 0. So, the powers of x which will appear in the Taylor series of sine functions are certainly going to be the odd powers. Well, this actually reflects the fact that sine of minus x is minus of sine x. That property is taken care of by these odd powers. Well, then we will try to write down the Taylor series of the function. It will then turn out to be summation k from 0 to infinity x to the power k by factorial k into f k 0. I can say that this is equals to f x as all possible derivatives are bounded by a single constant. All derivatives are bounded by 1. This then implies that sin of x is summation k from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the power k by 2k plus 1 factorial into x to the power 2k plus 1. Using the same technique, now you can write down the Taylor series of the function f x equals to cosine x also, because again I can calculate all the derivatives at 0. Similarly, all possible derivatives are bounded by 1, so the Taylor series will certainly converge and if you calculate the derivatives, you will see at 0 only the even terms survive and hence you get the Taylor series of the cosine function, which you probably already know as the series for cosine x. But that series represents sin x or cosin x actually follows from the Taylor's theorem. And since the Taylor series converges, the function is given by that same series. So far, so good. Now, we will look at an example where the Taylor series converges, but it does not converge to the function given. That can also happen. Now, to construct an example of a function for which the Taylor series does not converge to the function. The basic idea is to construct a function which has derivatives of all orders that has to be there, otherwise I cannot write down the Taylor series, but manage a function such that all its derivatives at the point 0, let us say is 0. Suppose that happens, then what will happen? So, this is my example 3. Try to construct a function f such that 
if n at 0 is 0 for all n. Suppose I do this, then the Taylor series converges to the function would mean that f x equals to summation n from 0 to infinity f n 0 by factorial n into x to the power n. But I know that f n 0 is 0. That means the right hand side is actually equals to 0. So, all I have to do is I have to construct a function which is non-zero and all whose derivatives at 0 is 0. If that happens, then the Taylor series of the function cannot converge to the function. So, the question is whether some such functions exist. Well, they do. This is how we construct them. I define the function f x equals to e to the power minus 1 by x if x is bigger than 0. I define it to be equal to 0 if x equals to 0. Notice that one thing is very clear here that the function is continuous. Well, I just have to check that limit x going to 0 f x is 0. That means limit x going to 0 e to the power minus 1 by x is equals to 0. If I put 1 by x equals to t, this would mean limit t going to infinity e to the power minus t, which is same as limit t going to infinity 1 by e to the power t, which is lesser equals to limit t going to infinity 1 by t. This is simply because e to the power t is bigger than or equals to t that follows from the Taylor series as t is positive, which is equals to 0. So, the function is continuous. So, question is, is the function differentiable at 0? Obviously, the function is differentiable if x is less than 0 and since the function is 0 on the negative axis of the real line, you can also see that the derivative also has to be equals to 0. Now, if x is bigger than 0, e to the power minus 1 by x is certainly a differentiable function. So, 0 is the only point where we have to check the differentiability. So, let us check it at 0 and try to find out what is f prime 0. So, f prime 0 by definition is limit h going to 0 f h minus f 0, but f 0 is 0. So, it is f h by h that is limit h going to 0 e to the power minus 1 by h divided by h. I again play the same trick of putting 1 by h equals to t. I will then get limit t going to infinity. Well, here I am bothered about h going to 0 plus let me say that what I get is t times e to the power minus t. This is then limit t going to infinity t divided by e to the power t which then is less or equals to limit t going to infinity t by t square. because e to the power t is bigger than or equals to t square by t, t square by 2. So, what I get here is limit t going to infinity 2 by t, which is again equal to 0. So, the derivative exists and not only that, the derivative at 0 is 0. So, now I want to prove that f n 0 is equals to 0 for all n. This is my claim. I will try to prove it by induction and for that obviously I need the expressions of f n's if x is bigger than 0. 
So the another claim is that f n x is equals to e to the power minus 1 by x times a polynomial p n at 1 by x for x bigger than 0 where it will turn out that p n is of degree 2 n which is not very important for us right now but this is what we want to prove. So let us see whether the thing is true for n equals to 1. The first one we have seen that f prime 0 is 0. So what is f prime at x if x is positive? We can just simply differentiate it is e to the power minus 1 by x times the derivative of minus 1 by x that is minus of minus of 1 by x square which is e to the power minus 1 by x into 1 by x square. So I will assume the induction hypothesis that the result is true for n. I want to prove it for n plus 1. So what is if n plus 1 x? That is uh, the derivative of the function e to the power minus 1 by x times pn x. Now there is a polynomial here which I know. So I will write down the polynomial here. It is k from 0 to 2n a k x to the power k the prime of this function. This is my f n plus 1 x. Well, this then turns out to be e to the power minus 1 by x into summation k from 0 to 2 n a k x to the power k times 1 by x square plus e to the power minus 1 by x times the derivative. So that is k from 1 to 2 n. So f n plus 1 x is e to the power minus x times the polynomial at 1 by x. So I have the power minus here and then I differentiate what I get is from k equals to 1 to uh, with a minus sign a k divided by x to the power k plus 1 times k. This is what I get. Now if I add the polynomial terms, I see that I get a polynomial of degree 2 times n plus 1. So this is e to the power minus 1 by x times summation k from 0 to 2n a k by x to the power k plus 2 minus k from 1 to 2n k a k by x to the power k plus 1. You see I get a polynomial whose degree is 2 times n plus 1 and in the variable 1 by x. So I get e to the power minus 1 by x times a polynomial p at the point 1 by x. So this verifies my second claim. But what about if n plus 1 0 then? That I have to calculate. So this is then limit h going to 0 f n h minus f n 0 divided by h. Since the function is 0 on the negative axis, all these f n h's are anyway 0. So h going to 0 minus if I take, I am certainly going to get 0. So what I am bothered about is h going to 0 plus. Now I have an expression for f n h that I will put 
it is limit h going to 0 plus, I know the expression of f n h, it is e to the power minus 1 by h times a polynomial p at 1 by h, then I have another 1 by h here. Now, if I write down the explicit expression of the polynomials and term by term, then I can look at the limit. So, I am essentially bothered about finding the limit, limit h going to 0 plus e to the power minus 1 by h times 1 by h to the power some m, you know, m is bigger than or equal to 0 certainly. Now, to calculate this limit, I again use the same trick which I have used it is limit t going to 0, it is limit t going to infinity, t to the power m, e to the power minus t. Now, this is then lesser equals to limit t going to infinity, t to the power m into m plus 1 factorial divided by t to the power m plus 1 as e to the power t for t positive is bigger than or equal to t to the power m plus 1 divided by factorial m plus 1. Now, this certainly goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. So, this implies the all the derivatives at 0 is 0 and hence the Taylor series if of this function if I look at the Taylor series turns out to be 0. So, it cannot converge to the function because the function e to the power minus 1 by x is always non-zero if x is positive. So, how can it happen that the Taylor series of the function converges to the function for all x? That is not true. It can converge to the function if x is negative, but for positive x, it cannot converge to the function. So, here we see example of a function for which the Taylor series although converges because it is 0 for all x, but it does not converge to the function.